we recall highlights from the previous part. We have g of finite group. Pi v is a unitary representation of g over the complex numbers. And we arrive at some main results for representations of finite groups. First, the number of classes of irreducible representations is equal to the number of Cauchy classes in our group. Then, we have sigma and sigma prime irreducible. Sigma is equivalent to sigma prime if and only if their characters are equal. Recall the character of sigma, this will be a function from the group to the complex numbers. We denote that by chi sub sigma, and if I evaluate a g, this is just defined as the trace of sigma g. Now, here we have a classification by characters. So the first part says there are only finitely many classes of irreducible representations. The way I could tell whether these are equal or not is just by checking the characters. So once I write down a character table for a group, I have a classification. Now, with that, we can return to the question of full reducibility. So I'll let pi v just be a general unitary representation of g. Full reducibility says we could decompose pi as an orthogonal direct sum of irreducible sub-representations. So I can write v as a direct sum, v1 through vk, where each v sub i is irreducible. Now, we have a rule for counting the number of irreducible types in there. So if we take the trace of pi to get the character of pi, okay, we can write this out as a sum of characters of irreducibles. The coefficient out in front is what we call the multiplicity of the irreducible sigma and pi. So this is just gonna be the number of v sub i's, which have pi restricted to v sub i equivalent to this irreducible sigma. So we call that n sub sigma. We have a formula for n sub sigma in terms of the characters. We just take the inner product, chi sub pi with chi sub sigma in the L2 norm. Once we have all these to check our work, if we take the inner product of chi sub pi with itself, that'll be equal to the sum of the squares of the multiplicities. Now, that leaves question, okay, once we know what all the irreducible types with their multiplicities are, how do we get to them? So how do I get the orthogonal projections onto each space of irreducible types? The story here is gonna be very close to the story for the finite abelian case. Recall how the finite abelian case goes. We start with convolution, so that's a type of multiplication on functions. Then, if I picked an f and l2 of g, we could take the weighted average of our representation. And with that, I could define projection operator onto the sigma types. So that was gonna be given by just taking, okay, this weighted average of the conjugate of the character that we're interested in. For general finite G, I'm gonna to have to put dimension of sigma out in front. Now, start with convolution. So our definitions are not gonna change from before. Just before we were working with abelian groups, so we have to be careful with the positions of variables. Now, for before, okay, if I have f and h, we define as follows, and then by doing change of variables, I can push the x to the other function. With that, we have the following properties of convolution. So convolution will be bilinear, okay, so constants can be pushed around. We could break up sums on either side. We have associativity, okay, so if I have more then two in our product, we could just remove all the parentheses as long as the order is the same. Then in general, okay, when we're working with a general finite group, we're not gonna have commutativity. So it's not always gonna be the case that if I take the convolution of F and H, we get the convolution of H and F. Now, if I have F a class function, then I will have this commuting property. So what we'll have is if I do a convolution with a character, Okay, it doesn't matter what order we do things in. For the finite abelian case, these properties follow immediately once we refer to an orthonormal basis of characters. Here, for the general case, instead of characters, we use matrix coefficients. Now, last time we saw, we could find orthonormal basis of L2 of G using matrix coefficients of irreducible representations. So this will be sufficient. Now, for matrix coefficients, 
We have a unitary representation pi. Pick two vectors u and v. The matrix coefficient for u, v. It's going to be a function from the group to the complex numbers. If we evaluate a g, we're just taking the inner product of pi g u with v. Now, why matrix coefficient? If we choose an orthonormal basis for the vector space, pick u and v from the basis. Then, with respect to the basis, each pi g is a square matrix. Our choice here is fixating on, say, the ijth entry. As we let the group elements range, we're going to get a function out of that entry. So matrix coefficient or matrix entry function. Now, let's take the convolution of two matrix coefficients. So we'll have one for pi, one for pi prime, both irreducible. We evaluate at x, and we write out our definition. So the first one gets a g, second one gets a g inverse x. We want to sort out the second term, so what do we do? Split the product using the homomorphism property of pi prime. Then I move the g inverse to the other side as g using unitarity. Now, if I want the g back in the first coordinate, I'll switch the entries and introduce a complex conjugate. This term I can evaluate using the short orthogonality relations. So if pi and pi prime are an equivalent, we get zero. If they're equals, we divide by the dimension, and then we're just going to pair the first entries and the second entries in inner products. Okay, and then the second one gets a bar. So this is what we have. If they're inequivalent, convolution goes to zero. If they're equals, we get this expression here. And if I want to get rid of the bar, I can switch the order, and that gives us matrix coefficient for u prime and v. Now, we push the d to the other side to get our formula. So if we take the convolution of two matrix coefficients, scaled by dimension, we're going to get back another matrix coefficient scaled by the outside entries. Now you'll note, this is very close to matrix multiplication. So what's happening here, okay, I multiply these together, we pair the outside entries, pair the inside entries in the opposite order. So this would be matrix multiplication if we paired the inside entries, paired the outside entries in the right order. Problem here is, okay, we're using pi x in the first coordinate. If I wanted what I just said, I would have to put it in the second coordinate. So with respect to some orthonormal basis, say u, u sub i, we take matrix coefficient for ui, uj. What I'm doing is picking off the ji entry of the associated matrix for pi g. So everything's in the other order. Now, let's compute the convolution of a character with a matrix coefficient. We choose an orthonormal base for a vector space. Then we can write our character as a sum of matrix coefficients. So here, we're just taking the sum of the diagonal entries for the associated matrix for pi g. If we compute, okay, we'll scale by the dimension. So for the previous board, okay, we write this out as a sum of matrix coefficients. These are inequivalent, we get zero. If they're equal, okay, we're for the previous board. So we're going to take the outside terms, put them in the inner product, and then take the inside terms and make a matrix coefficient. Now, we're going to move everything to the first coordinate. Then this is just pi of x u. So we're going to get the matrix coefficient for u prime and v prime. Okay, so you'll note this convolution just leaves the matrix coefficient alone. Similar idea for convolution of characters. So, okay, we scale by the dimension. If these are inequivalent, we'll get zero. If they're equal, okay, what we do, we just write one of these as a sum of matrix coefficients, and then apply the previous formula here. So, we're just gonna return the matrix coefficient. And then when we take the sum, we're just getting our character back. So, to summarize, if you have inequivalent representations, Convolution of character with matrix coefficient zero, character with character zero, they're equal, okay, scale by the dimension, and then character with matrix coefficients, matrix coefficient, character with characters, character. Next, if f is an L2 of G, we can form the weighted average of the representation using F. This is a linear transformation pi F carrying V to V. We've seen this before in the finite abelian case. For the definition, if I apply pi f to u, we have the following formula. So we take the weighted average of a representation pi by the function f, apply it to u. 
Note, we can define pi of f without reference to u. If we take the inner product of pi f of u with the vector v, we can move everything to the outside of the inner product. Then we have the L2 inner product of f with a matrix coefficient. For the L2 inner product, this matrix coefficient won't belong to the representation pi, but rather the complex conjugate of pi. Now, noting that we have an orthonormal basis for L2 of g using matrix coefficients of irreducibles, you see that this is close to what we would want for Fourier's trick, okay, picking off the coefficients of f. Now, this is going to be our analog of Fourier transform. Okay, we'll say more about this in a little bit. For general properties of pi f, okay, these will be the same as in the finite abelian case, same arguments. So if we apply pi, okay, we have left action of g on f, right action of g on f. Okay, these come out as before. If we take pi applied to a convolution, okay, we have the product. Okay, note this is gonna be the analog, the rule for convolution and Fourier transform. If I consider the star operator on functions, so we have f star of x equal to complex conjugate of f of x inverse. Then if we apply pi to f star, that's just gonna be the adjoint of pi of f with respect to the inner product for a representation. Now, something to note about the star operator that's interesting. If we apply star to a matrix coefficient, okay, we're gonna change the g to a g inverse, take the complex conjugate, I could push the g to the other side as a g using unitarity, and I could switch the order to get rid of the complex conjugate. So if we take the star of a matrix coefficient, we just reverse the order of the vectors. Now, we could apply that rule to characters. So if I write our character okay, as a sum of matrix coefficients, okay, we'll have the same vectors as indices if we use an orthonormal basis, then we see that star of a character is just itself. Now, we use weighted averages to define the projection operators of the spans of irreducible types. So, if I have pi v, any representation, sigma and irreducible, the projection onto the span of sigma types is defined as follows. So we have the dimension, we have the weighted average of pi, with respect to the character of sigma, complex conjugate. Now, we write this out. How do we interpret this? First, I could think of pi g, it's being a square matrix full of matrix coefficients. If we use short orthogonality, what happens when we interpret this? Okay, pi g will have an identity block for sigma and then zero everywhere else. Now, to see that we have a projection operator, okay, we need to check a few things. So first we'll check the easy things. First, I'm gonna want that our operator squared is just itself. So we apply our rules from before, okay? We can take convolution to a product and back. Then our rule says, if I take dimension, okay, convolution of a character with itself, get that character back, they're irreducible. And this is just our definition of p sub sigma. So p sub sigma squared is itself. Likewise, if we compose a p sub sigma with a p sub tau, where these are inequivalent, okay, same trickery, what happens here, when I take a convolution of two characters for an equivalent irreducibles, we get zero. Then, if I take the adjoint of P sub sigma, okay, from the previous board, we saw that that just goes to, okay, star on the inside, star of a character is itself, so we can just get back P sub sigma, showing our rule there. To show the remaining parts, it's enough to show the first part. So, if v is in the span of the sigma types, we show that p sub sigma v is equal to v itself. To simplify things, we note if v is non-zero in the span of sigma types, v generates an irreducible subrepresentation of type sigma. So it's gonna be enough just to compute on this space. So I'll assume that pi is equal to sigma irreducible. Okay, otherwise I have to include equivalences when we do computations. Now, First, I want to show that p sub sigma is an intertwining operator. We'll appeal to Schur's lemma to show that it's a multiple of the identity. Then we'll take traces to find the multiple. So first, if we apply sigma g to p sigma, OK, 
Okay, we write it out. Then we have a rule that lets us push sigma g into this sigma here. So it goes in as the left action. We have the chi sub sigma bar is a class function. Okay, it's a character. So the left action, when we push it to the inside, we can switch the g inverse and the x, and it becomes the right action by g inverse. Now, we have our rule that lets us pull the right action out of sigma. So it goes to the right of sigma g, and we have the piece of sigma is an intertwining operator. Now, by Schur's lemma, piece of sigma is a multiple of the identity. So we want the multiple. To get that, we're gonna take traces of both sides. So for the trace of piece of sigma, okay, we choose an orthonormal basis, u sub i. Okay, we have our expression here for the trace. So when we expand using the definition of piece of sigma, okay, we could collect terms to get this. Then when we collect, okay, these matrix coefficients with the i's, I have the character for sigma. Now, we know that the characters, okay, the irreducible characters, are going to give us an orthonormal basis for the class functions of G using the L2 norm. So this is just going to give me dimension of sigma. Now, that's trace on one side. On the other side, okay, what we're going to get here, we have a constant, so that comes out of the trace. Taking the trace of the identity, it's just going to give me the dimension of the space that we're on. So dimension sigma. Setting these equal to each other, dimension of sigma cancels, giving c equal to one. So on our irreducible space, p sub sigma is the identity. Okay, and then that's gonna to extend to all types sigma. Now, another thing we can note, if I take the trace of p sub sigma, okay, what's gonna happen here? We have a projection operator. So the trace is just gonna be the dimension of the image. In this case, that's gonna be span of the sigma types. So we're gonna have the multiplicity of sigma in our representation times the dimensions. So this gives us another formula for multiplicities when I divide by the dimension. Okay, recall, we have another formula here using characters inside of the L2 norm. For a concrete example, consider the usual action of S3 on C3. So here, the actions by permutation on the standard basis vectors. Now, we see that this representation has a trivial type and an irreducible type of dimension two. We write down the character table. We compute the projection operators. Now here, the dimension is equal to one. Character values are all equal to one. So we're just gonna take the sum of the three by three permutation matrices. We divide by the order of the group. That gives one third times a matrix consisting entirely of ones. You should verify that this satisfies all the properties of a projection operator. We know, okay, two pieces of information from before. If I want the span of the trivial types, I look at the columns of this matrix. So the trivial types are spanned by the vector one, one, one. We know that from before. If we want the multiplicity of the trivial type, we take the trace of the projection operator, divide by the dimension. So here the trace is equal to one, dimension is equal to one, so the multiplicity of the trivial type is equal to one. For the sign types, same computation. Okay, now for the character, we have one for the identity in the three cycles, minus one for the two cycles. When we sum, we get zero. That confirms what we know. There is no sign type in this representation. Finally, for the irreducible two-dimensional type, okay, note the change, I have to put the dimension in here, and then same basic computation. So you have two over six, twice the identity, two cycles are all gonna go to zero, and then I have minus ones for the three cycles. So when we put this all together, okay, we have this matrix here, which we note is the identity minus the projection for the trivial types. Now, if we consider the columns to get the span, Okay, for pi two types, okay, this is gonna agree with what we had before. This is gonna be all vectors, where if we take the sum of the coefficients, we get zero. If I want the multiplicity, okay, we're gonna take the trace, divide by the dimension. So the trace here is gonna be equal to two. We divide by two, and I get a one, confirming what we already know. There's a single type irreducible of dimension two. 
let's apply our projection formula to L2 of G as a representation space. Now, I want to project onto the matrix coefficient space for type sigma. That's the same as picking out the sigma star types under the left action. Okay, recall, sigma star is the dual representation to sigma. We write down our formula. So we have the dimension, we have the left action. Here I have the character of sigma star complex conjugate. It's gonna be the same as the character of sigma. And we apply that to F. We expand, then we note, okay, when the left action goes to the inside, G becomes G inverse. I have the definition of convolution times the dimension. So if you want projection onto okay, one of these matrix coefficient blocks, just take the convolution with the character, multiply by the dimension. Note this agrees with our formula in the finite abelian case. Now, as a final note, we return to this business of Fourier transform. So here we're interested in the analog of Parseval's identity. This is what we're going to call the Plancherel formula. So if we take the length squared of a function with respect to the L2 norm, it's given by this expression here. So we're going to sum over each irreducible class. We have the dimension, and then I have the trace sigma f times the adjoint of sigma f. Now this looks a little strange at first, but how do we make sense of this? So to motivate, let's consider okay, a sigma v sub sigma irreducible representation. We saw before, sigma f is going to give us an element from HOM from v sigma to v sigma, okay, linear transformations. Now, if we choose a basis, I could just think of these linear transformations as n by n matrices. For matrices, we can apply linear algebra to these spaces. So we can think of matrices as vectors. We can multiply them by scalars, and we can add them together. We also note, if we're interested in putting an inner product on a space of matrices, the rule that we use, I'll take the trace of our matrix times the conjugate transpose of the matrix. And that's going to agree with your usual inner product on C n squared. Okay, it's going to be the sum of the squares of the moduli of the entries. For example, the two by two case. So I'll take a two by two matrix, conjugate transpose. We multiply. We're only interested in the terms in the diagonal. So when I trace, we get the sum of the moduli squared of the entries, as promised. Leave it to you to work out the general case. Now, for a proof of the Plancherel formula, okay, we'll see it's enough just to verify for matrix coefficients belonging to a given irreducible. So, on the left-hand side, okay, I'll take phi uv with itself. From the short orthogonality relations, we get one over the dimension, norm squared of u, norm squared of v. On the other side, okay, when we're summing over the irreducibles, we'll apply all our rules from before. So for my first step, I can move the adjoint to the inside as a star operator. Then the product I can turn to a convolution. Next, star of a matrix coefficient just reverses the entries. Then we apply our rule for convolution and matrix coefficients. So we're going to inner product the outer entries to get norm squared of u. Then we get a matrix coefficient using the inner entries. So phi of v with itself. Now, I have to work out the trace of sigma applied to this matrix coefficient. So let's see what we get. If we take this expression and expand, okay, we get all of this. Taking the trace, well, I can move everything outside except for the sigma of g. That becomes the character of sigma evaluated g. Now, we apply the short orthogonality relations to this with this character written as sum of matrix coefficients. What comes out? We have the norm squared of v divided by the dimension. If sigma is equal to the complex conjugate representation of sigma prime and zero otherwise. So that gives our result.